My name is Shannon Morgan, and welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. I've had many Sasquatch sightings throughout my youth, and I'd like to share a couple of the ones that stand out to me. My name is Maggie. I'm now 54 years young, and I grew up on a very rural farm in Indiana. I was the second youngest of seven brothers and sisters, and it's ever since I can remember that our family, as well as our neighbors, knew about the mountain men. The mountain men were notorious for roaming the region and sometimes even stealing livestock if you mistakenly left them with the opportunity to do so. Now, we didn't have any mountains where we lived, so I can't provide much of an explanation as to why we gave them the name the Mountain Men. I suppose it was because they just looked like they would come from a secluded, mountainous area. My siblings and I were always warned not to step foot outside our fence at nighttime. There were even quite a few occasions where we weren't allowed to leave the house on account that the Mountain Men seemed to be more active than usual. My mother would often reassure us that these creatures weren't interested in us humans, but it was still a wise decision to avoid them whenever possible. Since my father wasn't into hunting, we usually had a pretty good idea of what he was doing when we'd see him storm out of the house with his rifle in hand. Of course, for the sake of keeping us calm, especially the younger ones, He'd provide us with the excuse that the neighbor's dog had been rummaging through the cornfields. When I grew older, I gained a more accurate idea of what was concerning the old man. Anyway, that was all just a little bit of backstory, to give you some sense of the environment I grew up around. I'll now tell you about my first up-close encounter with the mountain men. The reason that the following encounter is so significant for me is that it was the first time I saw these things with great detail. They weren't covered by the fence or the trees, and they weren't moving at a speed that made it nearly impossible to see them. I was seven years old at the time, and I was with my oldest sister, who was 16 years young. We had a beautiful pond in the middle of our acreage, and my sister and I decided to get in our family paddle boat and row out into the middle of it. I'd say about half of this pond was surrounded by trees and grassland, but both of us somehow failed to notice what was watching us from across the way as we entered the boat from the small wooden dock. I can remember that my sister was in the middle of telling me some funny story and making me hysterically laugh when I suddenly caught sight of the face that was poking its way out from the side of a tree. Its facial expression was so blank, and I don't remember it blinking one bit. It was such a surreal moment in the sense that I had always known them to exist, but like so many other rare animals out there, I had yet to lock eyes with one of them. For me, this took the phenomena to a whole new level and made things feel so much more real. I don't necessarily recall feeling all that scared at first. However, I do remember a hint of unease creeping its way in when I observed my sister's body language. Her mouth was slightly ajar, and I distinctly remember that her trembling hands were causing the paddles to vibrate against the sides of the boat. Should we go inside? I asked my sister. I think it's a better idea to remain still, she whispered. I've never seen them this close before, and it feels weird. Other family members had claimed to have gotten close to them but this was also her first time getting a good look at one of them. I know that sounds strange, given that she was 16 years old, but even though we all knew they were around us, the mountain men were still very elusive to the eye. It was much more common to hear them in the distance, rather than being able to spot them. There was no question that my father was the one to have seen them the most by that point but I'm confident that even he would find a close encounter of this kind to be more startling than most. As I realized that we were now drifting closer to the other side of the pond where our watcher stood, I began to poke my sister, deeply hoping that she was going to begin paddling us back towards the dock. But still, she seemed too nervous to do much of anything. 
seeing as how we were probably less than 30 yards from shore. I stripped the handles from my sister's grip and tried to turn the little rowboat around. It wasn't long after I did this that the Sasquatch tilted its chin up and made a whooping sound, much like what you'd hear from a large owl. Even though it was still creepy to see the sound come from its lips, I can't say that it felt all that aggressive. Even having growing up around these things, I still have very little clue as to why it made that exact noise at that exact time. I would be more understanding if my sister and I had yet to locate it, and it was simply mimicking another species to conceal its presence. However, it was completely obvious that it was aware that we were both staring right at it. It was either the noise or the fact that her little sister had essentially ripped the paddles from her hands, but she was quick to take them back and reclaim the protector role. Since she was much stronger than me back then, she was able to move us away from the animal at a much quicker rate. Then things got even weirder. It wasn't too long before we made it to the dock that the Sasquatch revealed itself entirely and diagonally strolled over to the water's edge. It was right away that I was able to see it was a male, if you know what I mean. Likely due to my young age, I remember being pretty grossed out by that little detail. I remember I couldn't help but let out a little shriek on account that I thought this thing was about to enter the water and swim after us. Instead, all it did was crouch right in front of the water before submerging its head in a completely upside-down fashion. It held it there in that position for somewhere between 5 and 10 seconds, and then slowly withdrew it before returning its gaze onto us from the other side of the pond. It was at that point that we exited the rowboat as calmly as possible and proceeded to walk out of the area. Immediately leading up to the dock was a narrow clearing that ran between two walls of thick prairie land, and it was as we were walking through there that I heard the whooping sound one more time. When I looked over my shoulder, the Sasquatch was essentially skipping its way back into the woods. When I say skipping, I mean that. Its strides were just so elongated in its motion. From time to time, our family would stumble upon tracks, primarily following days of heavy rainfall. What I always thought was most peculiar about the tracks was how their feet often appeared to move about the terrain in a symmetrical, single-file line. The skipping movement that I watched this one make while it headed back into the woods would certainly match many sets of tracks that we had found. Both my sister and I were anxious that the Sasquatch might have intended to make its way around the pond to confront us, but we made it back to our house without any further sign of the thing. I remember that my father wasn't home at the time when we walked through the door and told my mother about the sighting, but I'm pretty sure it was later that night that my parents had a very serious discussion about it. I have vivid memories of my father seeming very discouraged after hearing that the Sasquatches were willing to reveal themselves during the daylight. It was quite clear that this notion worried him. Understandably, he and my mother didn't want to have to worry about the kids during all hours of the day. After the internet blew up and became what now seems like a life necessity, I began to read what other people had to say about these things. It immediately impressed me how many people from so many different parts of the country had had similar experiences to my own. However, I will say I've never read any other encounters where someone watched one of these things dunk its head into the water, and hold the position. Maybe it was just playing around, and even trying to get a rise out of my sister and myself. I'd also like to note that I've seen many, many images of tracks on the internet, and I believe that quite a few of them are legitimate findings. I say this because many of them have that single file stride to them, and I know with certainty that they often move around in that fashion. The other strange encounter that I'd like to write about happened about seven years later when I was in my early teens. The funny thing is that this was the first year that we started raising goats. 
we started with a mother and three or four babies. They were a lot of fun and had a ton of energy that enabled them to play all day. Unfortunately, it quickly became evident that hosting these lovable critters attracted more activity from the mountain men, and that quickly put a damper on what started as a very positive addition to our property. It was a summer day, and I remember sitting at the kitchen table, working on homework for a summer school course that I was attending during the weekday mornings. My little brother suddenly burst into the house, screaming about how it had just ripped one of the baby goats from his bare hands. I'm not exactly sure why I thought he was kidding around at first, but it was probably because the mountain men rarely came close to us. If they were ever that close, we didn't know about it. My father wasn't home at the time when my brother was bantering about the baby goat abduction, and the incident was enough to bring tears to the kid's eyes, something he was known to do rarely. I ran up the stairs to one of my sister's old rooms. The family knew that this room provided the best view of our extensive backyard. It was right as I arrived at the window that I saw the first figure dashing towards the woods to the left. Though the sight was at least 80 yards out, the positioning of the mountain man's arm made it clear that it was carrying something that was thought to be of great value, another small goat. It was by that time that I had already made my way down the steps that I heard the sound of the front door opening. My mother had fetched the rifle and fired a couple of shots into the air as she stepped off the back porch. When I peered outside through the back door, I noticed another figure dashing off in the same direction as the previous one. It also carried one of the goats in its grasp and barked in our direction. There was no question that it didn't appreciate the noise of gunfire. I'm not sure what came over my mother, but I watched as she rushed towards the area where the goats lived. Since she had always been reluctant to go where the mountain men had been spotted, I've always looked at her reaction as clear evidence that she fell in love with those little goats. Worried about her well-being, it wasn't long before I followed her lead. When we arrived at the pen, the only goat that was left was the doe, and it was instantly obvious that her neck had snapped like a twig. It was a horrifying sight, and even though they had previously given me the creeps, I believe this was the very first time I ever felt like I was truly in danger living among these beings. My brother was still teary-eyed when we returned inside, visibly traumatized by what had allegedly happened to him. Very understandable. My father returned home not too long after that, and we sat him down to explain what had happened. When he sprung up to fetch the rifle, this was when my mother gently put her hand on his shoulder and stated that she wanted to move out of the area. She talked about how the stress had been eating away at her for years, and that she viewed this particular incident as a very bad omen, that it would be just too hard for her to disregard and continue living around these mysterious beings. Honestly, I was expecting my father to throw a fit, but he didn't. I'm not sure whether it was my mother's demeanor, or if he had been worrying just as much, but he caved and it wasn't long before we listed the property for sale. Though we remained in Indiana, we moved to a much more urban suburb far away from the sticks. I've always wondered if my parents informed the buyer about all the things that lived in the region. I remember asking a few times, but both my mother and father would always give very vague responses. I guess I can't blame them if they didn't disclose that kind of information, after all, what were they meant to say? There's always been a part of me that's wanted to return to the area and ask some of the locals about any present-day activity. But even though we lived out there for quite a few years, we never became very close with any of the neighbors. I appreciate all of you taking the time to read my report. Maybe I'll submit a few more in the future. My experience with the Bigfoot creatures happened nearly 20 years ago, while I was living with my family in a small town in Wyoming that's in proximity to Yellowstone National Park. 
The funny thing is, I spent years of my childhood thinking that these animals were ghosts. Even though my parents weren't farmers, my dad couldn't pass up on what he said was a deal of a lifetime, which consisted of almost 18 acres of land, which were once used for farming. Therefore, multiple structures on our property were used for various farming duties. My bedroom window looked out towards an old shed that was made of wood. This thing looked like it was about to collapse at any given moment. My parents thought that these old structures provided a lot of character for the land. They had always been passionate about purchasing antiques, and I just think that they really liked the history that came along with some of those items. It was one night, when I was probably around six or seven years old, that I heard the door to the shed slapping against the door frame. When I finally walked over to the window, I saw a very large, dark figure crouched just beyond the door frame. It was one of those doors where if you opened it, it would automatically swing closed. This creature was crouching with its back turned and kept casually nudging the door opened as soon as it closed. Why it continued to do that, I don't have the slightest clue, but it was very eerie. At first, I thought I was seeing things because my parents used to remind me that our eyes can play tricks on us. But as I continued to look at this thing, I quickly recognized that I was awake as ever. At this time, the figure never turned and looked my way, but there was still a very ominous feeling that washed over me and encouraged me to run to my parents' room to wake them up and ask them about what I was seeing. At first, they ignored me and told me to get back to bed but I insisted that at least one of them come to my room and see what I was talking about. I remember holding my father's hand as he walked over to my bedroom window, and together we peered through the glass. As you might have guessed, there was nothing there, and the shed door appeared to be closed and secured. Of course, my father tucked me back into bed and repeated his belief that it was nothing more than a bad dream. It was a frustrating feeling because I knew that I had seen something. It was just too large and just too real. When it was light outside the next morning, I somehow found the courage to walk with our dog over to the shed. At first, my dog wasn't acting weird or anything, but it wasn't long before she seemed to pick up on a scent that was a bit behind the shed. Her snout was essentially glued to the ground. It was clear that something was puzzling her deeply. It was rare that our dog ever wanted to go inside the house before we did, but this was one of those occasions. I just couldn't understand what that creature would have been doing in the shed. It's not like we ever stored livestock or any kind of food in there. The only conclusion that I could come to was that it was either trying to hide from someone or something, get warm, or nurse an injury. I often wish we had a surveillance camera installed in that shed so we could have seen what was going on inside there that night. Or, perhaps the creature had left and shut the door behind it. It was a long time before I saw anything else after that. However, I did hear a bunch of strange noises in the middle of the night, all of which my father attributed to coyotes. Although I was young, I was informed enough to know that there was no coyotes. It was about two years later when I had my next encounter. I woke up to the sound of my parents arguing. I remember specifically how my dad was pacing up and down the hallway. It was as if he was trying to decide what he should do next. At first, I had no clue as to what they were talking about, but it quickly became evident that they didn't want me to hear whatever it was. So, being the curious child that I was, I placed my ear against the door and tried to get some sense for what the concern was. I remember hearing my dad saying, there's nobody we can call about this kind of thing. It wasn't long after that that my mom mentioned how she would call the cops if my father didn't. It became obvious to me that my dad didn't want any attention on our property, at least of this nature. Even though they were trying to keep their voices down, 
their nervous demeanors sometimes changed the volume of their voices, and I would be able to hear certain things. Things that reminded me of that experience I had a few years back. My mother kept mentioning the word intruders. Whatever she was talking about, it was clear she didn't want to acknowledge these things as being anything other than human. But I could tell by my dad's tone that they had different opinions on the matter. Eventually, they went back into their bedroom and closed the door, leaving me with little opportunity to hear anything further. To be completely honest, my parents had been doing a lot of arguing, and I knew that certain issues between them were beyond the subject of those intruders. It was because of this I didn't want to pry too much into their conflict. However, it was probably only a couple of days later, when I was fishing with my dad, that I asked him if someone had been trespassing on our property. His delayed response made it rather clear that there was something on his mind, but then he quickly tried to regain a look of confidence and informed me that everything was okay. Even at my young age, I was able to tell that something had managed to get under my father's skin, and there was something that was seriously worrying him. There was a while there where my father would quickly change the subject whenever I brought that whole topic up and it's safe to say that my mother was no different. Not long after that, there was one night where I was awoken by what sounded like heavy breathing coming from below my window. However, this breathing didn't at all sound normal. It was as if whoever was responsible for it was incredibly sick, like they were having extreme respiratory problems. I became so scared of the noise that I finally stepped out of my bed to tell my parents. But it was as soon as I stepped onto the creaking floorboards that whatever was outside seemed to notice, and the breathing came to a halt. That freaked me out so much, because it immediately gave me the impression that this thing had approached the house solely because it was interested in me. At one point, it had been a few minutes since I had heard those raspy breaths, so I decided to walk over to the window to see if I could see anything. At first, I was inclined to look towards the shed, but everything appeared normal. That was when I noticed the movement just to the left of the window. The dark shape had managed to blend in with the darkness and completely caught me by surprise. I couldn't help but let out a gasp, one that was apparently so loud that it provoked my parents to come running into my bedroom. It was very clear that they were already on high alert, due to what it was that they hadn't been disclosing to me. As I sat on the edge of my bed, I watched my father walk over to my window. His eyes widened, and that was when the three of us were forced to endure what was an eardrum-shattering scream. That noise was so deeply unpleasant, and it's not even something that I feel confident describing. What I can say is that I could feel it rattle my insides. Visibly distraught by the noise, my father started pounding on the wall right next to the window, obviously trying to scare off the intruder. Unfortunately, all this did was make the noise worse, and both the volume and pitch drastically increased. My mother had been using her hands to cover my ears, but it was when the noise worsened that she had no choice but to clutch her own. The noise was so agonizing that it provoked my father to start pounding his fist directly on the window out of desperation. That was when I watched the glass shatter. The blood instantly began to flow down my dad's arm. It was soon after this that the horrible noise stopped, and aside from our own rustling, there was utter silence. Another thing that I often reflect on was how our dog was nowhere to be found during this incident. We later found her under the bed in my parents' room. It was incredibly challenging for my mom to convince her to come out from under there, and when I went to pet her, she was still shaking. That was when I demanded that my parents explain to me what was going on. I remember both of them looking at each other, silently trying to establish who would be the one to speak. My mother sat me down at the kitchen table and put her hand on my back. 
She began to talk about how spirits from another world were visiting us, but they weren't in any way looking to harm us. I wasn't the dumbest of kids, and quickly disputed her statement, asking why Dad had just been so insistent on driving these spirits away from the property. If they could do no harm, what difference did it make if they were lurking in or around our house? Additionally, why was it that our dog was so blatantly intimidated? With every one of my questions, there was pretty much only one way that they would respond, that no matter what, they would keep me safe. I remember feeling so helpless and vulnerable, like there was absolutely nothing I could do if things were to get out of control and we were to be attacked. Back then, it was just so hard to comprehend that my parents were just as lost as I was regarding what was going on. I believe that this is something that is incredibly challenging for any child to understand, that their parents don't have all the answers to what life throws at them. There was this one day where I got home from my friend's house earlier than expected, and there was a vehicle in the driveway that I had never seen before. When I entered the house, I saw an older man who seemed to be inspecting the walls while standing in the living room. He was holding a cross and muttering some dialogue that I couldn't make out. Whatever he was saying, he seemed pretty concerned. When my mother caught sight of me, she rushed over to my side and guided me to my bedroom. She then proceeded to inform me that the man who was downstairs was there to cleanse the house of any negative energy. I remember having trouble understanding what she meant by all of that. By that point in my life, I don't believe I had seen the movies like The Exorcist. I just hadn't been exposed to that type of ideology. It was especially strange because my parents weren't at all religious, and I think that reinforces the idea that they were willing to try anything to understand the phenomenon that was taking place around our property. Like I said, the priest did come off as very concerned for whatever energy he felt in our house, but we'd all soon come to find out that had no direct correlation to the things that I had seen outside my window, at least that's how I see it. A couple more weeks had passed by, and it was starting to seem as though my parents were feeling less stressed. I suppose that would mean that they had seen less evidence of whatever had been responsible for making them feel so panicked. Even my dog, who I believe was very intuitive, was acting like her normal self. There was this one morning where I was walking with my mother and our dog through the various trails that surrounded the edge of our property. I remember I was in the middle of telling my mother about the latest episode of a television show when we saw this large figure laying halfway in the trail that we were directly walking on. I distinctly remember her hand pressing against my chest to prevent me from walking any further. That was when the dog started to whimper. Soon, those quiet whimpers transitioned to muffled growls before transitioning back to whimpers. It was as if she couldn't decide how to react to what lay maybe 30 yards before us. It was very hard to make out what this thing was, as it was laying in a fetal position with its back turned to us. It was massive. Even though I could see that it was breathing, it was making no noise at this point. Something that really stood out to me was how the long, matted hair on this thing was like a cinnamon red-brown color. This did not at all resemble what I thought I had seen outside my window, but there is always a chance that the time of day was responsible for altering my perception of color. As we began to back off, that's when this thing became a little bit more worrisome. Without looking at us, the figure rose onto all fours and swiftly scurried into the woods that surrounded the trail. Aside from the sound of crumbling vegetation, there seemed to be no other noise. I'm not exactly sure why, but this is when my dog started to lose her cool. She kept looking back at my mother and I, and it was like she was suggesting that we head back to the direction of our house. Our animalistic instincts were warning us that the environment was no longer safe and we needed to get out of there as fast as possible. I have this haunting memory of my mother singing the song Old MacDonald. 
She was trying to instill confidence, even though her voice was jittering. If she hadn't been wearing sunglasses, I'm certain that I would have seen tears in her eyes. She was really that frightened. This might sound weird, but the figure on the trail reminded me at the time of something that you would see on the TV show Sesame Street. There are a few people who I've told about this, who asked me if I smelled anything out of the ordinary whenever I was near these things. Mysteriously enough, I can't say I remember anything standing out. However, I am aware that many people report that kind of thing. Perhaps I was just too startled to notice. We made it back to the house without any complications, but I do often wonder what would have happened if my father were there with us. My father was so protective of his family that I sometimes wonder if he would have provoked the creature to pursue us. For all I know, that could have been a male that we saw and it might have become territorial if it learned that an adult human male was in the vicinity. I remember when we made it back to the house, our dog immediately went into the laundry room and lay near her food and water dishes for the next few hours. It was the strangest thing. She would go from acting calm and cool to beyond petrified when she saw any sign of these mysterious creatures. My father wasn't home when we returned, and this was back before any of us had cellular phones. Otherwise, I do not doubt that my mother would have called him and asked him to return right away. When we saw that creature on the trail, I will go ahead and estimate that we were nearly half a mile from the house, which makes me feel very lucky that things didn't get out of hand. We probably would have never been seen again. By the time my father finally made it home that day, my mother seemed to no longer care about what she had said in front of me. She pleaded that my father sell the property and we move far away, preferably to an inner city environment. Even though my father was very concerned about my mother, it was clear that he felt as though he had invested way too much into this property. He just refused to be bullied by anyone or anything. Again, we ended up going quite a while without any scares. However, the final straw happened one evening a couple of years later. I remember it happened in the summer, because I can distinctly recall the smell of barbecued chicken that we had cooked outside on the grill. The three of us were sitting at the round table, enjoying the fresh barbecue food, when all of a sudden, our dog began to bark incessantly. I can even remember how my fingers, as well as my face, were covered with barbecue sauce as I turned my head to look in the direction of where she was barking. A female deer was right up against the screen, using a hoof to push inside. The deer ended up breaking the screen with ease, and it wasn't long before it was thrusting its torso through the opening. Our dog continuously pretended to lunge at the deer, but it was never vicious enough to deliver a bite. Neither of my parents had any time to react, before we watched the dark figure rush in from the side of the house and grab the deer's hind legs, causing it to squeal out in anguish. The deer desperately squirmed to break free, but the struggle was no match for what I initially thought to be some kind of giant dog. This creature was pitch black, and it wasn't until it picked up the deer and ran off on two legs that I felt we were looking at a monster. It looked like a werewolf, it ran off in the opposite direction, but I'll never forget how it turned around and looked at the three of us with this grin. That facial expression is something that still haunts me. There was something about it that looked so evil, so diabolical. It was as if this thing was far more intelligent than any animal. It had an agenda. To this day, I am convinced that the look was the primary reason my father agreed to leave the property for good. I can't say for sure, but I am fairly certain that I saw more than one kind of species while living on that land. Although I never got a thorough look at their features during those earlier occasions, there was most definitely something different about what we saw attack that deer. All I know is that it had a long snout and pointed ears, very much like what you see on a German shepherd. 
I became so distraught about all of those experiences, and it was truly a breath of fresh air when we moved to Idaho. My family went for years and years without discussing those matters. It's like we wanted to completely move on from the bad energy that it had invited our way. It wasn't until years later, when I was listening to a friend from college talk about a UFO that they had allegedly seen a few nights earlier, that my interest in the paranormal returned. We got into a deep discussion, and I assured them that I believed their story, due to having experienced crazy events of my own. We really bonded over these conversations. They were like therapy after having spent years of bottling up so much disturbing information. Having realized how good that was for my soul, I started to open myself back up to investigating that stuff. I now have a theory that the dogman is a subspecies of Bigfoot. Still, I often wonder why I was given the feeling that this creature was pure evil. Be careful while you're out in the woods. My brother Sean and I were kids when this happened. I was 10 and he was 8. That makes this about 30 years ago. Time flies because it seems like it was yesterday. It all started when my parents got a divorce. They hadn't been getting along for many years, but were staying together for my brother and I. When they started throwing things at each other and breaking stuff, I think they realized it was time to part ways. My dad had a full-time job, so we stayed home with my mom. Mom didn't want us hanging around alone while dad worked, and he was out of town a lot, as he was a trucker. My mom owned a small business making specialty soaps, which she could do anywhere, and she sold them at the local shops. All of this meant moving, and since mom couldn't afford the little bungalow we were renting, dad kept it, and we could go stay with him whenever we wanted, which was nice. So my mom called up family, and we moved back to her hometown, which was about 30 miles from where we had been living. We didn't have a lot of money, so we moved into a house built by my great-grandparents. It had been sitting empty for 20 years or more. I'm kind of struggling with telling this, because it brings back a lot of really hard memories. My dad passed away in a trucking accident a few months after we moved. I think the majority of their fighting had to do with money, as well as him being gone all the time. And if things had been a little better, they wouldn't have split. And who knows, my dad might still be around, though I would have never had this experience. But it is what it is. The house we moved into sat on the side of a huge hill. Some might call it a mountain, right above a big sandstone cliff, with outcroppings also right above it. It was about eight miles from town, which meant we'd have to ride the bus once school started. The dirt road up to the house was no picnic. It wound around and up the side of the hill. We were the only ones on it. It ended at our house, so in the winter, we would be responsible for keeping it plowed. Mom told us it was a temporary place until we could get on our feet. Hopefully, that happened before school started. It was a really awesome setting. No neighbors, and nothing but wilderness as far as you could see. We're talking about northern Idaho. It took a lot of work to get the house ready. My dad helped, and when it was done, it was really neat. Unfortunately, there was no indoor plumbing, and we had to use an old outhouse. That got old pretty fast. We finally were able to move in, but at first, it was just the thing for two young boys with nothing much to do on a summer day. We spent our days exploring, though Mom wouldn't let us go into the trees, as she was afraid we'd get lost. But we didn't really want to anyways, as they seemed kind of dark and spooky. We soon grew to love the place. I can't tell you how many adventures we had there, mostly in our own imaginations, except at the end, and those were real. Too real. Sean and I were free spirits running and exploring, and living like wild animals. We especially liked to play softball, until the ball disappeared, that is. About our third month there, it all came to a screeching halt. Our carefree lives became lives of fear. It all started when Sean and I were playing on a rock outcropping. I don't recall exactly what we were playing, 
but I remember he was standing at the very top of it, a sort of sandstone hoodoo, when he just stopped as if frozen. Knowing us, we were pretending to be climbers or pirates, and we were making a lot of noise. But Sean just stood there, staring into the trees that edged the big meadow the house sat in. The tree line was maybe 50 feet from us, and the forest very thick and dark. Sean was literally frozen. My first thought was that it was part of the game, so I just waited for him to say ahoy matey or something and inform me he had just spotted an enemy, but he didn't. He just stood there, and after a bit, I began to think he was really looking at something that was really scaring him. My first thought was a bear or a mountain lion, or maybe even a moose. I finally asked him what was up, and it seemed to break the spell. He came down off those rocks as fast as he could and started running top speed towards the house. I didn't know what he was scared of, but if he was that scared, I figured that I had better run too. So I did. He came barreling into the front door and slammed it behind us and locked it. Mom had gone into town, making a delivery and getting groceries, so we were all on our own. Sean looked like he had seen a ghost and we went all around the house, locking the doors and all of the windows. When he finally settled down enough to talk, he told me he had seen a huge man standing back in the trees, watching us. I couldn't see it because I was too low. I asked him why that was so scary, as I didn't really understand it. Maybe it was a sheep herder from across the mountain. Why would that be so scary? He said he didn't know, but he couldn't explain it. It was the scariest thing he had ever seen, and if we had a phone, he would have called mom to come home. He went and sat on his bed in his bedroom, and I kind of looked out the curtains, going around from window to window in the house, trying to see if this supposed man had come closer. I didn't see a thing. When mom finally drove up, Sean started crying, so I went inside and helped her carry the groceries keeping an eye out and trying to explain to her what was going on. She went into Sean's room and talked to him for a long time. And when she came out, I could tell she was a little spooked herself. She went outside to look around, and I couldn't stand the thought of her going alone. So I followed her. We looked all around the house, and though we couldn't see far up into the trees, we stood there and looked for a long time. Sean and I were kind of known for having wild imaginations, so I think my mom didn't really believe there was anything there. And I'm not even sure that I did. Maybe he had seen a deer and made it into a big man. Sean had an imaginary friend at one time, so we kind of wondered. Finally, after dinner, mom sat down and we all talked a bit. Sean told us it couldn't be a bear because it had a human face and it was all hairy. He swore he was telling the truth and that he had actually seen this thing. And he asked if we could all leave right now and go to Grandma and Grandpa's house, at least for the night. The poor guy was scared to death. Seeing this pretty much convinced me he was telling the truth. And I think Mom was now wondering if there really hadn't been something out there. It was late, but seeing how upset Sean was, Mom decided it would be okay to go into town for night. So off we went. It wasn't quite dark when we left, and I remember her locking the house up, something she had never done before. We ended up staying several days, and even at that, Sean didn't want to go back. But we had to. We couldn't just move in with our grandparents. They didn't have enough room, and my uncle was already living there. So we returned, and everything was just as it was. Nothing was different. This event really traumatized Sean, as he refused to go outside to play anymore, even though it was the height of summer. I had to walk with him to the outhouse. All he wanted to do was stay indoors and make models or draw or read, and he always kept the doors locked. That, of course, put a damper on my outdoor activities, as I sure didn't feel comfortable without him, and with nobody to play with, I might as well stay indoors too. It wasn't long before he started having nightmares. He always dreamed the same thing. Someone was trying to unlatch his window and get in. He would wake up to a scratching noise and fly out of his bed and into mom's bedroom. After a few nights of this, 
he refused to sleep in his own room. Since I hadn't heard anything, I just figured he was dreaming all of it. So mom moved his single bed into her room, and he slept in there. She was really getting worried and asked me what to do, but I had no idea. Sean was now wanting to go live with dad. Finally, mom conceded and sent Sean to live with her parents, as dad was never home. It was supposed to be a short stay until Sean got over his phobia, or whatever it was. When he left, he said he was really scared for me and mom, and felt guilty for leaving us. I really missed Sean, and I hoped he'd get better. Mom was usually around, but when she went into town, I would sometimes stay at the house alone. The first time I stayed there alone, I have to admit, I was pretty scared. Sean had made me promise not to go outside, but I still wasn't sure he had really even seen anything, and I did miss being outdoors. I stayed inside the first few times, except for the outhouse part, which scared me to death, I will admit, but at least it was on the opposite side of the house from the forest, and it wasn't too far from the house. Finally, I could stand it no longer. I needed to go outside. I couldn't live indoors anymore. Even though Sean had said if I went outside, I might never come back in. Well, I went out. I walked around the outside of the house and strained to see into the forest, but I didn't see a thing. Then I got a little braver and walked over to the spring. The spring had a small fence around it to keep cattle out with a gate. Inside the fence, right next to the spring, was the softball that had been missing for a few weeks since before Sean saw the man. I wondered how it got there. We had been playing ball on the opposite side of the house, and no, we hadn't lobbed it over the roof. This was really odd. We always set it on the back porch when we were done with it, and one day, it was just gone. What I saw next about made my heart stop. Huge tracks in the mud, and they had five toes. I mean, these things were big. I went back inside, forcing myself to walk and not run and then I locked all of the doors and all of the windows. When mom finally came home, she wasn't happy with what I had seen. I took her to the spring, and she took a bunch of photos. Then we left and went into town, where she told my grandpa. We all came back together, including my uncle. They went over to the spring and looked around a lot. Then they had asked me where we had been when Sean saw the man, so I pointed it out and they went over there. When they came back, they looked real grim. They had found even more of the big tracks over there in the soft dirt, even though they looked much older. Everyone was beginning to believe Sean, and my mom looked very serious. It wouldn't be long before the rancher who leased the land would bring up his cattle to eat the tall bluestem grasses. When fall came, we would move them back to the lower meadows, but soon he would be around some. Mom swore we would be out of there by the time he moved his cattle out. The summer wore on, and I was now pretty much never left alone. The rancher moved his cattle in, and they were now all around, grazing on the tall grasses. I liked that, because I knew they would be like a warning system, alerting us if something was around. Then the bad news came. Dad had passed away in a wreck. Someone had swerved in front of his truck, and rather than hitting them, He had gone off the side down a steep embankment, and it was all over for him. This hit my mom really, really hard. Not only did she have to deal with her own grief, but she also had to deal with ours, plus taking care of all of his personal stuff, as he had no close relatives. The only good thing was that he had a life insurance policy, and this would pay for me and Sean to go to college, as well as a little extra money for my mom. Now mom was never at the house, and I grew tired of it. She made me go everywhere with her. I would go stay with grandpa when I could, and it was good to see Sean, who seemed to be getting back to normal, but there just wasn't enough room there. So, I persuaded mom to let me stay home one day. The rancher was coming around a lot, and I promised I'd stay inside, so she relented. I think by now she was both physically and emotionally exhausted. I fiddled around indoors a bunch, then really wanted to go outside. I had promised not to, 
but I wanted to go see if the softball was still there at the spring. I was still wondering how it had got there in the first place. Mom had made a batch of blueberry muffins, so I grabbed one, carefully looked around, and then started outside. It was then that I saw movement in the trees right above the spring. I put on the brakes as fast as I could. Before I could even turn around, something black stepped out of the trees and leaned over the fence around the spring. It picked up something, then stepped back and started slowly coming my way. My brain said it was a bear, though my instincts said otherwise. And I'd always been told to never run from a bear, so I started backing down towards the house very carefully, all the time watching this thing. It slowly walked towards me, and all of a sudden, I felt a blackness go into my heart. I knew I was going to die. I shouldn't have broken my promise. I should have just stayed inside. People have asked me what it looked like, and all I can say is that it was bigger and more muscular than the biggest football player I had ever seen. It had longish hair, and it really wasn't ape-like, nor was it human. It was kind of both, but also neither. It's hard to describe, but if you ever see one, you'll have its image burned into your brain forever. I've tried sketching it, but I'm not much of an artist. For some reason, maybe because of its playfulness, I got the impression that it wasn't that old. Maybe like a human teenager. Anyway, I was finally back to the house, bumping into it backwards. If I could just inch my way around to the door, I would be okay. The black creature stopped, as if it knew what I was thinking and that I would soon be gone. It raised its arm and threw something to me. I say to me and not at me, because it was a gentle toss, a perfect toss, and the softball practically landed in my hand without me doing a thing to catch it. I stood there, kind of stunned. All of a sudden, I knew it wouldn't harm me. I didn't even pause. I just tossed the ball back to it. It must have seen Sean and I playing ball. I couldn't believe what I was doing. I swear, I could see a bit of its teeth showing, as if it were smiling, and then it tossed the ball back to me. We both stood there for a long time, and I kind of came to my senses. I needed to continue getting back inside. I still had the muffin in my other hand, totally forgotten, and instead of the ball, I threw the muffin and ran. I was quickly inside, where I locked the door. I then looked out the window, and it was still standing there. I kind of imagined it felt hurt. Was this true? How could I possibly know what this creature was feeling? It probably wanted to eat me, deep down inside, and the ball playing had been a lure, but I somehow knew that wasn't what it wanted. I went into the kitchen and got the bowl with mom's blueberry muffins. I stepped outside and around the corner of the house. The black creature was still standing there. I threw the whole thing at it, bowl and all, and then ran like hell. Once inside, I could see it picking up the muffins and eating them. Even though I was scared stiff, I actually started laughing. Finally, it turned and went back into the trees. I then heard the sound of an engine. It was the rancher. Now I had realized what I had done, and for a moment I thought it was mom, and she was going to bust me for eating all the muffins. Times were hard, and that was our snack food for the whole week. I had never baked anything in my life but I soon found her recipe box and was making more muffins. I finally had them in the oven, and by the way they smelled, I had done something right. I was about to take them out when I noticed a shadow over the window, and then a huge, black face looking in. I screamed as loud as a ten-year-old can scream. It then ducked and disappeared. The rancher was soon at the door, knocking and asking if I was okay. His name was Mr. Richfield. I was in shock, and I told him what had happened. He ran outside and looked all around, but didn't see anything. I think he thought I was making it all up, as he hadn't been in on the recent happenings. By now, the muffins were burning. I managed to get them out of the oven, and they weren't too bad. I have no idea how I had the presence of mind to deal with it, but I let them cool and put them in another bowl, like the one I had thrown outside. Just in time, Mom was coming up the road. 
Mr. Richfield met her outside, and I could see them talking for a very long time. They both came into the house, and I offered the rancher and Mom a nice warm muffin. Mom didn't even notice that they were warm and a bit overdone. We all sat down and talked about the Bigfoot, but there was no way that I was going to tell them that I had played ball with it and also fed it the muffins. They would think I was crazy either way, for doing it or for pretending that I had. But now, having seen it up close, I wanted nothing more to do with it. I wanted to be far, far away with Sean in town. Mr. Richfield was very concerned for his cattle, as they were now milling around, though I could tell he was having trouble with the concept of a Bigfoot being around, or even existing for that matter. He was going to start carrying his rifle, and I think he was kind of shook up when Mom pulled out the pictures of the footprints. He was more shook up when they went to the spring and found fresh ones. Mom had asked him to stay around for a bit while she packed our things into a bag. It was nearly dusk when we left, and the rancher was right behind us going out. As we wound down the road, I knew we would never come back. Not to stay, anyway. We would get our stuff out and the house would sit there, abandoned yet again. It made me feel glad to be leaving, but yet also kind of sad. As we wound down the road, I turned and waved goodbye out the window, hoping the Bigfoot would find the muffins that I had left for him by the back door, along with the softball. My name is Bob, and I live in Minnesota. In October of 2008, I had an experience while out bow hunting for white-tailed deer. What I experienced, I could only hear. I never saw what was making the noise. The noise alone scared the life out of me, and I carried an AR-15 while bow hunting the rest of the year. I don't know if it was a Sasquatch, or even if they live in this area. This occurred early in October. I was bow hunting 20 miles south of Wadena, Minnesota. I had chosen a section of field that requires about a half a mile to hike because nobody ever really goes back there. And then I had found a heavily used game trail. About 40 years ago, this field was used for grain and corn, but now is fallow and only used for hay on occasion. I was hunting the north end of the field, which is only about 70 to 80 yards across, but extends for several hundred yards to the south. The temperature was in the low 60s, and it had been a beautiful, sunny day. I was in a tree stand facing west and saw a buck enter the field from the western wood line and began making its way across the field towards me. It was standing in some tall grass at 40 yards, and I decided to shoot. I shot and almost immediately felt that I had missed. I flinched. The buck ran into the woods on the east side of the field and appeared uninjured. I have a personal policy of always searching for blood if I shoot at an animal to make sure I am being a responsible hunter and not leaving game in the field. I climbed out of the tree stand just before dark. It was the time of dusk where the woods are too dark to see, but you have enough light to see in the fields. I was crouched down looking for blood and my arrow in the tall grass where I had shot at the buck. From the west of me, I heard movement in the brush, so I peeked through the tall grass and saw a larger buck enter the field. I knocked another arrow, hoping for a shot. I had taken a deep breath before drawing back my bow. From the wood line directly behind me, about 40 yards away, I heard a sound I had never heard before. It was a deep and guttural sound, and then a high-pitched and very shrill sound. What freaked me out was the volume. There was no possible way for me to make a noise as loud as this. I would say, at a minimum, twice as loud as me, screaming at the top of my lungs. I spun around and looked towards the wood line, but the woods were already too dark to see into. When I heard the sound, I was instantly afraid, like a primal fear that you cannot control, and I had goosebumps on my neck. The buck that had been in the field acted unusual when he heard this. Typically, a deer will stop for a second, perceive a threat, flag his tail, and run into cover. The second this scream occurred, this buck put its head down and bolted at top speed into the brush where there was no trail. This freaked me out because now I was in the middle of a field with only grass for cover and some unseen screaming thing 40 yards away. 
I was now facing east again, looking towards where the sound had come from. I was trying to see any movement or hear any other sounds. I still had an arrow knocked, and I thought to myself that if this animal made the sound again, I would try to replicate it to draw it out into the field where I could stick an arrow into it if I had to. I did not want to try a call after hearing only the first sound because it was such a shock to me. I was questioning if I had heard it right. Then the shock of my life, as I was crouched facing the wood line, the animal sounded off again. The sound was clearly directed right at me and it was so intense. I could barely put it into words. I remember that it was so loud that I closed my eyes because it was uncomfortable to feel a sound like that. It almost had percussion to it that felt like it roughed you up. The sound it made sounded extremely aggressive and did not make me feel happy to be armed with only a bow. After a few seconds, I composed myself and tried to replicate what I had heard. The sound I made sounded like a pitiful whimper compared to what I heard and did not even come close to matching the starting or finishing notes that this sound made. When I tried to replicate the sound, the animal immediately snorted or grunted at me. It was throaty, like how a hog snorts, except I could tell that the sound was coming from about my own head height in the wood line. As it snorted, it began moving away from me to the south, staying just inside the wood line. It was moving through the woods faster than I could run at a sprint. As it moved, I could hear two things. The first was the sound of the brush clearing and branches breaking, and the second was a very rhythmic thumping sound, which I took to be footfalls. I know the sound of deer hooves hitting the dirt, and this was a ton louder than that. Plus, it was not the same rhythm as deer hooves. I could hear it breaking branches as it traveled inside the wood line for about 250 yards, and then it got quiet as if it had stopped or was being stealthy. I got out of the woods very quickly at that point and felt pretty upset by the whole experience. At the time of this event, I was finishing a college internship with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. I told the story to a game warden I knew, and he jokingly said it was a Bigfoot, but then said I probably just heard a fox. I have tried to talk to a few people about this, and everyone just pokes fun at me and asks if it was a Bigfoot. The truth is, I don't know what it was and would really love some closure on that night. This was absolutely not a sound made by a deer. This was not a coyote or a wolf howling at me. I have looked up fox calls and I have not found what I heard that night. I also don't think a fox makes noises six feet in the air and makes heavy footfalls. This was not a cougar roar as I ran into one on a different occasion. It screamed the loudest of any animal I have ever heard in the wild, hands down, and the buck was also terrified. The sound seemed to be coming from about head height. It screamed and grunted, and it sounded aggressive. This started with a family deer hunting trip in the fall of 1966 by myself, my father Harry, mother Lola, and our pet dog Susie. We lived in a suburb of Salem, Oregon, called Kaiser, and we were traveling to an area southeast of Bend, Oregon. The trip was to have lasted five days, but got cut short due to some serious Bigfoot events. During the second night in camp, we heard a noise, like NFL linebackers crashing through the trees surrounding the camp, brush getting kicked into, and small logs being thrown about. Our pet dog was frightened in a life-or-death manner. This lasted around an hour, it seemed like. Then, around two hours later, my dad got up and left the tent to use the restroom. He came back after what seemed like a half hour, frightened in a way I had never seen him like. He was beet red in the face and was breathing hard. He then made an announcement that we were returning home the next morning and said that we were going to tell friends that hunters were shooting too close to camp. We tried to get some sleep and left first thing in the morning. Time to move this report around 10 months into the future, in the early fall of 1967. My dad had started a secret letter writing exchange with his fraternal twin sister, Gladys. I knew of the letter writing 
but my mother Lola had no clue. He would post the letters privately, without my mother's knowledge. Eventually, he sort of slipped up on security a bit, and I was able to see partially the content of one of the letters. My dad was talking about getting the D brothers and sisters together for some sort of reunion, although I didn't know what it meant at the time. I was able to see other parts of letters. They were sent once a week. Eventually, a near-complete story came out in my 10-year-old mind. The D brothers and sisters, brother Charles, sister Hazel, and Gladys, would gather in the fall of 1968 at the vacation cabin in L.A. Pine, Oregon, which was owned by brother Charles and wife Edna during deer season. They were going to use the deer season, 1968, as cover to kill a big creature, or something, a beast. Bigfoot was not in the family lingo at the time. Let's back up and give you a feel for these family members. They were pioneering ranchers who settled in the Fort Rock Valley of Northern Lake County, Oregon. They were trained as expert firearms persons from very little kids by a family connected to the Old West. My dad was the best shot, so guess who would have been the main shooter on this trip? At Thanksgiving of 1967, my dad took his brother aside and brought him into the fold. I saw them both walk up the street after dinner to have a private conversation. The letters then indicated planning a meeting to be held at the motel in Bend, Oregon in early March of 1968. My dad started getting weaker physically as work became more demanding. By late September of 1968, my father suffered an aneurysm of the descending aorta relating to heavy smoking. He then died about 10 days later. But while he lay dying in the hospital, some strange events occurred. I knew the storage place for the letter exchange file my dad had kept amongst his rockhound educational books and pamphlets, but my mother had no knowledge of them. Then one day, I was walking to school while my dad was in the hospital, and parked near our house, around the corner and out of sight, was a Ford Falcon station wagon with U.S. Forest Service markings and paint. No one was inside the vehicle. When I returned home and checked the letter collection stash file, the letters were gone. All I've ever thought is that the law enforcement arm of the USFS broke into our home and took the letters, all without any warrant presented to our family. How would they have found the location? One way, only one way, and that was to bully a man laying dying in a hospital, my father. After the death of my dad, the private contract postal station in our suburb of Kaiser treated my mother and me very rudely. Was there a USFS law enforcement intercept of our mail going on? I was born and raised in San Francisco in 1951. At an early age, I became interested in UFOs and Bigfoot. I read most of the early books by Ivan Sanderson and witnessed the release of the Patty film. At about age 16, I began treks into the National Forest that is north of San Francisco. I would spend days alone camped out and during the day, I would attempt to find Bigfoot. At age 19 and during the Vietnam War, I joined the USAF and was placed in the security police. In 1981, I joined the San Francisco Police Department and worked out of the narcotics unit. I have since retired, thank God. I now live about half an hour south of Sacramento and only a few minutes away from the Tahoe National Forest, where we do a lot of gold prospecting. Actually, they do the prospecting and I'm checking for signs of Bigfoot along the riverbanks and adjoining areas. In 1971, after completing boot camp and specialist training, I was shipped off to my first base in Arizona. At the time, it was an SAC base, Strategic Air Command. It had a couple of wings of B-52s parked in ready alert on the flight lines. Their job, if you saw Dr. Strangelove, was to penetrate Russian territory and bomb their cities. It was a very tight base, and security was everywhere, of course. On this base at the time, and I know they still have it, was the aircraft boneyard 
where they had stored thousands of decommissioned aircraft that they would use for parts. While working a graveyard shift with another security policeman, we were asked by the guys working the entry patrol point to bring out a few cups of coffee. We got them the coffee and began driving out to the storage area. The weapons storage area is where they stored the nuclear bombs that were used for the B-52s, and it was an area of 10 acres or so, with bunkers spaced every few yards. The area was surrounded by fencing, wire, light posts every few feet, and an entry control point consisting of a small building near the entry gates. The building is manned by the security division of the security police, and they also utilized K-9, since this was such a sensitive area. To get to this area from the base, we had to drive down a two-land road. Both sides of the road was the aircraft graveyard. Chain-link fence lined both sides of the road, and every few hundred yards, there were gates that were locked, allowing entry to the boneyard. The drive was maybe a mile, or perhaps a mile and a half. It was approximately 2 a.m. when we drove down this road and delivered the coffee. Naturally, there was no other traffic out there. We spend maybe five minutes talking to the guys who worked the entry point, and then we turned around and left, proceeding down the same road we took to arrive. A couple minutes into the drive, and directly in the center of the road, we saw an object. At first, we thought it was a car. As we got closer, we realized it wasn't a car, and upon inspection, we were shocked to see that it was a propeller engine from one of the aircraft. It was missing the propeller, but it was about the size of a Volkswagen. We looked for drag marks, but couldn't find any. We also discovered that there were no entry gates nearby. It appeared that this engine must have weighed at least a ton, and apparently was taken from the boneyard area, transported over the fence, and placed into the center of the road. We called for our boss, or the flight chief who arrived, and after scratching his head several times, with a whole lot of what is this, called for his higher up. We were told to get back in our car. For the next couple of hours, we watched as various higher ups showed up, including the base commander, who we could observe examining the engine and general area. Our flight chief then told us he would meet us back at operations and to wait for him. We did so, and met him back at the office. He told us that we were never to mention this to anyone, and to forget that it ever happened. As time went on, and I came to know the security guys, security police back then was divided into two categories, law enforcement, which I was, and security. Law enforcement was like your town cop, whereas security was the guys who guarded the aircraft on the flight line and storage areas. The security guys were on base, and they began to relate stories to me. I was informed that many times in the weapons storage areas, they would observe something very large, bipedal, and very fast. When they would try to bring in the dogs, the dogs would refuse and often try to pull away. These are sentry dogs. They aren't your normal guard dogs, but they would refuse. They would see this thing, usually running from light pole to light pole, and it was something that occurred quite regularly. And this thing could never be located. I was then sent to Japan, and after my tour there, was given orders to my next base, which was just outside Phoenix, Arizona. After about a year there, I was given the job of desk sergeant. I worked various shifts and mostly nights. After hours, all calls from citizens wanting to report UFOs came to my desk, and I would have to inform them that the USAF no longer investigated UFOs and would advise them to call their local police departments, as if they would do anything. I had, of course, read about the runaround that people got, but I was now a participant in it. The calls came in quite often, and many times I would ask for relief from the desk, and a few of us would go out and attempt to spot these UFOs. One night, while working the desk, It was during the summer of 1974, not sure of the month. I would say about 2 a.m. in the morning, and the SAT team came into the office. SAT is an acronym for Security Alert Team. 
This is a security division of the security police, as I explained above. The SAT team was a mobile unit made up of two to three security personnel armed with M16s. They were a quick mobile alert team from any type of incursion on the base. On this night, there were three of them. They would come into the office quite regularly and get some coffee, stand around, and chat. So they come in this night and they are very quiet. They get their coffee and just stand around saying nothing. They all got this look on their faces like they had just seen a ghost. So I'm sitting there watching them and I finally ask them what happened. They looked at me like a deer in the headlights and one walked over and says, you won't believe what just happened to us. They say they were parked out on the flight line with the Dodge six-pack vehicle shut off. Two of them are in the front seat and one is in the back. They are sitting and relaxing and chatting. This is a very open area and the flight line at that time was in of course a desert area with no fences. Just flight line and beyond it was desert. The passenger in the front seat is turned around and talking to the guy in the back seat when they see this very tall black thing come running towards their truck from the desert. They said this thing was running at a full sprint. The guys in the front seat screamed to the driver to start the truck and get out of there. All three looked towards the thing as it approached the truck. The driver got the truck started just as this thing was bounding jump and jumped over the rear bed of the Dodge. All three watched as it ran off at an angle into the desert. They then departed the area at top speed. Very tall and very dark. Humanoid shaped was their description of this thing. And of course, very fast. Fast forward again a few months. I'm sitting on the desk once again, around 1 to 2 a.m., when I begin getting all kinds of calls from civilians in the area that UFOs are all over in the sky in Phoenix. I once again give them the brush off. I'm telling some guys I work with what I'm getting, and since they too are interested in UFOs, I decide to get relieved off the desk for half an hour, and a bunch of us grab our cars and go out to the flight line. We pointed our vehicles towards the White Tank Mountains in the distance. We were sitting there in maybe five different cars. When the guy in the car to my right screams, what is that, pointing out into the desert. We all turned on our high beams and we could see this tall black thing maybe 100 yards away. It appeared this thing was in a slow run or jog. We all started our cars and drove to exactly where it should have been, but nothing was there. How it got away or eluded us is unknown. It should not have been able to get away. There was nowhere to hide. I was now convinced that the SAT team had seen exactly what they say they did. My first incident with a creature I could not explain was in the summer of 1966. Our family traveled south down to the Oregon coast. We crossed over into California, and Dad drove back down past Crescent City. We drove back inland towards I-5. There were five of us in the car. Dad, Mom, my older brother, who was 16, myself, at the time 15, and my younger brother, who was 13. We spent the night in Dunsmere, California. The place we stayed in had small cabins and was west of the I-5. I do not know the name of the place but there were several cabins, maybe 10 to 12 of them, and a caregiver operator's home. The people working there were a couple in their late 40s. They had three large dogs that were a shepherd mix. The dogs were very friendly, as my brother and I played with them, throwing a tennis ball. It got dark early due to the thick forest and the trees in the area. At about 2 a.m., I woke to the sounds of dogs whining. The dogs were chained up at the house of the caretakers. A mercury vapor light was lighting up the area between the house and our cabin. I believed the distance to be about 60 yards. I could see the dogs by the porch area of the house and they were whimpering and huddled all together. I could see they were afraid and looking out near an outbuilding or garage. I looked towards where they were looking and saw in the street area a huge hair-covered creature walking. It was at least eight feet tall and had long arms. It was just strolling on the small street and then into the woods. 
I was stunned. I did not know what it was, and then I went back to bed. But I did not sleep the rest of the night. The next morning, the caretaker said something had spooked his dogs, as they refused to leave the house after he fed them in the morning. I knew nothing of Bigfoot, and did not want to say anything about what I had seen. The next year, my parents bought property in Ashford, in Echo Valley. We spent lots of time up there. Dad had a small 16-foot trailer, and the kids slept in a large tent. We saw elk and deer walk through our property all the time. We would also see them in the meadow area, where there were several apple trees. The elk would pick them off the tree, and the deer seemed to feed off whatever dropped from the tree. In the late 70s, we heard weird howling noises from across the river. And one night, we heard a very loud scream from down by the river. It sounded like a high-pitched woman screech. The next morning, several people in the place commented about the scream. I by then had heard of Bigfoot, and I believed that was what I saw when we were in California. I was down at the river once collecting rocks to circle the fire pit, and I heard a grunting from across the river. I left right away, not bothering to take the rocks. In about 1982, a large group of our friends were camping on the property in an old army tent. My younger brother was sleeping next to the tent sidewall. His girlfriend was next to him, and several others were in the tent. He was startled awake when a large hairy hand reached under the sidewall and grabbed his arm. He yelled, and everyone awoke. He was so shook up, he armed himself, built up the fire, and locked himself in his truck. He was in his late twenties at the time, and was out of the army. After that, I only went there on day trips, and never camped there again. I know that there are Bigfoot creatures. I have heard them, seen them, and smelled them. I don't hunt or fish, or go on my own up in the area unless I am armed. Talk to the people in Echo Valley, and ask them what they have heard or seen. Don't forget to enter the Bigfoot Case Files and Bigfoot Encounters Narrated Giveaway that was posted on October 1st. The link to the two-hour marathon is in the description of this video. Please see the Bigfoot Case Files community page for an itemized list of all the prizes you could win, as well as the official rules. Thank you so much for participating. I wish you all the best of luck. If you've had an encounter or sighting of a Sasquatch and would like your story told here, please email us at bigfootcasefiles at mail.com. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for listening.